Here we're going to talk about the molecular orbitals of water and how to determine them and ultimately we'll be sketching out a molecular orbital diagram. So to start off I've selected uh, water and I will draw the coordinate axes as will best help us during this process and I've also noted that the character table on the right which is C2V for this particular point group. Okay, let's begin. First, we need to identify the primary axis of rotation and make that the Z coordinate, which should go right through the water, the oxygen atom. And then we need to make sure that the plane of the molecule uh, is contained in one of the coordinate axes and we're going to choose the x-axis as that plane so here's the x-axis and then the y-axis is going to be coming out of the page like so. Okay, so now that we have the coordinate axes chosen, uh, we need to look at uh, a couple of different things. We need to treat both of the hydrogens together and then the oxygen separate and then we'll be able to combine them into what are molecular orbitals. So let's start with the hydrogens and atoms first uh, and then we'll do the uh, oxygen atom to determine all of the uh, symmetry groups that each one of these uh, atomic orbitals represents so that we can see how they match up as molecular orbitals. All right, so we need to go through each one of the symmetry operations, that is the identity operation, the C2 rotation, and the two reflections to determine what happens to the s orbitals on the hydrogen. Now we do not need to assign coordinate axes to the hydrogens because there's only an s orbital on them and that's a sphere and so it has no directionality so there there really is no need to put a coordinate axes there. If it was something some other atom that had p orbitals, for instance, we would have to assign coordinate axes to it, but that's not the case right now. Okay. All right. So, during the identity operation, which is E, nothing moves, and so we're considering for the two hydrogen atoms... and we'll keep track of how many atoms and orbitals move during this operation and what gets transformed into itself. So here's E, C, 2, sigma V, and sigma V prime. All right, for the two hydrogens, uh, during an identity operation, nothing moves. So there are two orbitals that have not uh, done anything there. Now, during the C2 operation, which is a 180 degree rotation around the Z direction, one hydrogen transforms into the other and vice versa. And so both of these move, they're interchanged, so they get a representation of zero on C2. And then for sigma v, the first sigma v, we see that's in the xy or xz plane. The xz plane contains the the molecule, and so there is uh, no movement, right? So this hydro, the hydrogen, the pointer here, the hydrogen here doesn't move. It just reflects onto itself. Same thing with oxygen, same thing with the other hydrogen, right? So we should have a representation here of two. 
And then for the sigma v prime, that is the yz plane, which is right here through the, through the middle of the molecule. And so this hydrogen over here gets moved over to that side, and that hydrogen moves over here. So it's very similar in operation to the C2, and the representation is also the same. It is zero. Okay, now we have a reducible representation, and this will reduce into the two possible um, atom the way these atomic orbitals can be arranged. Right? So here's our reducible representation. Now there's two ways of doing this. We could use the systematic way of reducing uh, reducible representations and I outlined that in the video about ammonia. Or since there's only two representations here, we could probably solve this just by inspection. And, and that is, we just look at it and, and come up with the answer. All right. Now, since we have two orbitals, we will need two uh, or two hydrogens, each with a single 1s orbital. We will need two molecular orbitals. That means that we will have two uh, of the representations over here. So it's either going to be an A1 and an A2, or an A1 and a B1, or an A, A1 and B2. We'll just have to figure that out, right? Okay, so we need two of these representations over here to add up to be this reducible representation. So let's look. In order to get a zero at C2, we will need some negative one there, correct? So at this point, we know that one of the representations is uh, either B1 or B2 because they have a negative in the C2, and that will get us down to zero. And we also need a zero at sigma V prime and we see that the negative one is uh, for sigma v prime is for b1. So one of the representations is b1. Which is one, negative one, one, negative one. Now we just need a representation that sums with this to be the total up, here, up at the top. And we can see that that should be the A1 representation. Because if we have 1, 1, 1, 1, and if we add those together uh, for, the for the E operation or identity operation, 1 plus 1 is 2. For C2, we have... 1 minus 1 is 0, and so on. Okay, now we have the two representations for the atomic orbitals for the two hydrogens. Now we just need to solve the representations for oxygen. Now this one is not too difficult because the character table actually allows us to see them right away. Um, we have a 2s and 2p orbitals on the oxygen that are in the valence shell. So those are the ones we need to look at. All right. So we have the 2s orbital and for oxygen, so I need a little bit of room here. Okay, so oxygen has a 2s orbital and it also has 2p orbitals, and naturally it also has a um, a 1s, but it's not in the valence shell. 
Okay. S orbitals are totally symmetric uh, orbitals. Right? They're, they're a sphere. So if we look, we have a totally symmetric orbital right here. It's A1. So the S orbitals uh, have the same symmetry as A1. So we can just write down A1 right there. Now, the P orbitals are already done for us in the character table. You can see them right here. Here's the PZ orbital, here's the PX, and there's the PY. So we see PZ has the symmetry of A1 in the C2V point group, and PX has B1 symmetry, and PY has B2 symmetry. Um, this is because the P orbitals are at right angles to each other, and we chose the coordinate axes uh, such that they would line up with where the P orbitals will be. Uh, so we can just write down what the orbitals are for oxygen. Of course, we could also just draw them out and determine how they transform with the operations uh, with as we move along and then match those up. But considering it's already done for us, let's just use that. So we have A1 and B1 and B2 orbitals. So now we will have to take a little break before we finish this problem and combine them together to make the molecular orbital, orbital diagram. Uh, so we will see here that the bonding orbitals are going to be um, A1 orbitals, and then we also have B1 orbitals that are bonding, and then we have a non-bonding orbital that is B2 because it does not match any of the symmetry that we see on the hydrogen atoms. Okay. Uh, that's all for the moment. All right, so I've sketched out uh, a skeleton of the molecular orbital diagram so that we can start filling in the middle. And you note that I have the oxygen on the left and the hydrogens on the right, and I have included the representations that we figured out in the previous page, that is, we have a P orbitals that are A1, B1, and B2, and an S orbital on oxygen that's A1. And then for the hydrogens, we have an A1 representation and a B1 representation. Now, uh, this isn't to perfect scale, but uh, we're trying here. The closest, or the closer that you get to having it spaced out properly, will make it easier for us to determine what actually happens in the molecular orbitals for the energy levels that they end up being. Now, sometimes the uh, s orbitals that we have are very far apart in energy. And we can see here that the a1 orbital that we have on the oxygen has a significantly lower energy than the A1 on the hydrogen. And the farther apart we get in energy, the less interaction uh, we have. So, considering that these are very far apart, the A1 that is from the S orbital on the oxygen has only a very small shift in energy down um, but be, but it's very slight. Oh, I should also fill in uh, where our electrons are. Uh, let's see here. Oxygen has six valence electrons, so that's two, three, four. And it doesn't really matter um, what p orbital we put them in here. 
uh, in the when we're talking about atomic orbitals, but we'll determine where they end up after we finish the molecular orbital diagram here. So we can see here, this one is almost non-bonding because it's very similar in energy level. Uh, the only reason why it gets pushed down a little bit is because there will be a small interaction between orbitals that have the same symmetry. So because the S orbital here has the same symmetry as uh, a bonding orbital up here, then it will push it just a small bit down. But and it is quite, quite a small interaction. All right, next, we see that we have a B1 interaction, and the B1 interaction should be a little lower than the A1. Uh, just from the fact that it won't match up with the symmetry of the A1, and so any anytime we have the same symmetries between two orbitals, there'll be a, f a pushing or a force on them to change their energy uh, level, right? So since these two orbitals do not match in energy, uh, there will be less pushing on them, and so the B1 can actually be a little lower energy uh, than the A1 can be. So next, we should have an A1 orbital because that's, that's going to generate a bonding interaction. Um, we'll also be generating some antibonding interactions here in a minute. And then the B2 uh, orbital on oxygen doesn't have any B2 character on the hydrogens, so that one does not change in energy. And then we also are going to generate some antibonding orbitals. And so we'll have uh, A1 here and a, a B1 above it. It's kind of going off the screen there, but it's a little higher up. Okay, so we can finish filling in the molecular orbital diagram now. So we have eight electrons to place in. So that we've done four now, six, and eight. So what we see here are two bonding interactions right here, and two that are essentially non-bonding interactions. So I suppose we could consider these to be the lone pair um, electrons. But of course, they look a little different when they have when they're in molecular orbitals uh, than when they are in atomic. Uh, maybe this one doesn't change so much because uh, there is no interaction with uh, any orbitals over here. And then we have two antibonding orbitals. Right? Uh, and let's just make sure that we didn't miss any. So we have two, three, uh, so that's five, six. So we have, we started with six atomic orbitals. We need six molecular orbitals. So let's just make sure that's four and two more, that's six. All right, we should always end up with the same number of uh, molecular orbitals as we started with uh, for atomic orbitals.